council, and so, um, and I'm a, a, a climate leader in that role too. Um, I wanted to welcome you to our event uh, about municipal clean energy and the role that the city of Menominee has in um, addressing climate change, global climate change on a local level. Um, I, uh, I want to say a couple words about um, our organization. Uh, Wisconsin Conservation Voters is a nonpartisan nonprofit. Uh, we serve the entire state of Wisconsin and focus on um, addressing environmental issues, the, the most pressing environmental issues of our time uh, through policy change. And so uh, primarily we work on the state level in the state legislature. We have a, a, an office just a block away from the Capitol and we work in the Capitol to protect our land, air, and water. Uh, primarily right now uh, the most, most pressing, pressing issue that we're looking at is uh, clean drinking water and climate change on the local level. We see a lot of opportunity uh, to address climate change on the local level. So we're working in communities across Wisconsin, including Menominee, uh, to uh, set, put forward aggressive uh, local climate goals. Um, this event is presented by Wisconsin Conservation Voters as well as the League of Women Voters. And so Anne-Marie is here to talk a little bit uh, about their organization too. Hi, I am slightly shorter than you can, <laughs> but not much. Um, I'm Anne Marie McClellan, and I am one of the co-presidents of the League of Women Voters for the Greater Chippewa Valley. Um, and we are also very interested in the environment. We are also a nonpartisan group um, that is issues oriented, and our core goals are to educate voters and get people out to vote. Um, you can see our vote signs out there. Um, we are also celebrating a 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote um, in 2020. We're selling calendars to educate everyone. <laughs> 72 years, so it's the effort to stick with it, whatever we're working on. You, it's, you have to endure and go multi-generations, but maybe you know, someone will see the benefits of our work, and I think that's what we're all here and we're concerned about. Uh, our chapter has an environmental study group, and it's headed by Greg Miller there and Mark Leach. Uh, it's also part of that, an active member of that study group. So you, that's one of the reasons why we're here teaming up with Kate on, on these very important issues. Um, Ellen Oaks, who is my co-president, is here as well. And um, I'm glad to see you all show up, and thanks, Kate. <laughs> Zimmergy uh, Brewery for hosting us today. They actually opened their doors uh, on a day that they were closed to have us uh, in here to talk about clean energy. Um, so if you haven't yet, please uh, buy a beer or a soda from them. Um, they uh, they brew it right here, um, and it's very good good beer. I know I've tried. Um, uh, a couple of other things. Um, we uh, just as far as what our what we're looking at for an agenda. Um, we have a. Uh, a speaker to, here to speak about climate change. I'll introduce him in a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what the city of Eau Claire has actually done to address climate change on a local level, kind of what the steps we've taken. Um, and then talk about why we're asking the city of Menominee to take the same steps. I want to mention that um, Mayor Randy Kanak is here, and so uh, we have his ear, and so there will be uh, an opportunity to learn about um, how you can get involved and um, asking some questions. And so, um, he, you know, we may have an opportunity to ask him some questions too, if he's willing. Um, so thank you for being here, Randy. Um, here, Randy. Uh, last thing, last housekeeping thing. Uh, there is a, a sign-in table in the back here with a blue tablecloth. Um, I, we'd, we'd love it for you to sign in if you haven't already. So as you're um, heading out, if you if you would be signed in, that'd be great. Um, okay, so uh, our first speaker is Dr. Jim Bolter. He is a professor of chemistry at the Watershed Institute at UW-Eau Claire. Um, he has published works on climate change and is a climate scientist. So he, has, he comes with a lot of information, really compelling information to share about um, climate change, of course, why it's real and we should accept it on a basic level and, and what we should be looking at doing about it. Um, he's a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby, which he'll speak a little bit more about. And um, most importantly to me, he's a, a dear friend and my neighbor in Eau Claire. So uh, welcome, Jim.
Well, that's one of the nicest introductions I've had in a long time. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, so I'm going to speak for just a little while, but I'm going to cut my remarks fairly short because I'd love to have an opportunity to answer questions because I think a lot of times, especially in my profession, I'm kind of used to lecturing at people, and that can kind of go long and it can kind of you know, get a little dry. So um, uh, I just sketched some notes for myself and I'll speak for a bit and then I certainly welcome your questions at the end. Um, so my background is, uh, as Kate said, in, in atmospheric chemistry. My doctorate is in atmospheric chemistry chemistry from the University of um, uh, Colorado at Boulder, and I've been in, in Wisconsin for about 15 years. Um, and in those 15 years, you know, we've seen a lot of, we've seen a lot of changes. Uh, I've been studying climate for uh, about 20 years now, since my doctoral degree um, in atmospheric chemistry. And, um, you know, people sometimes ask me what, what surprises me most uh, about climate change, or if there are any surprises about climate change. And, and my answer is typically, um, yeah, I think 20 years ago, if you'd asked me, I would have said this is this is a problem for our kids, our grandkids, um, maybe now in, in, in the developing world and in other places. Um, but you know, I was reading an article recently that really fascinated me, and it was saying uh, it was asking, it was talking about how scientists talk about climate change in, in the public view, and and what it said is typically we um, tend to report only the more conservative uh, views of si climate science. Um, because it's really important that when we go into the public that we speak with one voice, that, that the public doesn't perceive the divisions. And while um, uncertainty is a, a crucial element of science, that is being able to say what we know, how much we know it, and where our knowledge stops is a crucial element of science, uh, when we say the word uncertainty, in the general area, then that's very easily misinterpreted as, oh, they don't know. And so scientists want to speak with a single voice on the issue of climate change because um, we learned the hard way uh, what, what um, um, advertising the natural give and take of science in the public eye very quickly led to interpretations of, oh, well, they disagree on this. And in reality, uh, many of you, I think, probably know. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, what percentage of scientists do you think uh, agree with the consensus that climate is predominantly human caused uh, and is not we're feeling the impacts of it already? Just who wants to shout out a number? 97, 90, 99. And the answer is all of those, what they had mostly coming, it's, it's 95% or better, right? Some studies say 97%, some say 95%, some, some inch upwards towards 99%. But it's, it's, a, it's a strong consensus understanding. Um, and, and so when scientists, whether that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, who's heard of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? Just a few, okay. So uh, that's the United Nations body that, that, uh, uh, that gives the most authoritative view of climate science. But what we found is by and large, uh, when scientists have spoken either through the IPCC, through the National Climate Assessment, which is uh, the United States sort of analog of that international body, um, we have probably undersold the reality of climate change because we wanted to be cautious. We didn't want to be wrong. We wanted to err on the side of fact. And so even we are subject to that, right? So reading science all the time, guess what? I came across with the consensus viewpoint that it was an issue for our children, for our grandchildren, maybe the developing world now. But we all know now, what we all know is that we're seeing its effects now. And, and I say now, I mean this week, the repeated wildfires in California with such heartbreaking and devastating effects. The floods in Houston from not a hurricane, but a tropical storm, the Melda. Um, repeating and, and actually beating the, the awful record of Harvey just a year ago, or two years ago. In Washington, D.C. had set uh, 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 records just last week for, for high temperature, affecting 100, what did I say, 131 million people in the, in the Southeast, uh, high temperature records. And then, of course, there's the Midwest. Um, so we've, we've touched on all corners of the United States now, but the Midwest uh, Iowa, Nebraska, who could forget this spring? 
Um, whether it was the farmers who were unable to plant in their fields, and, and I would include probably right around here too, right? Um, and, and, and we're seeing, of course, now farmers um, losing their lands uh, at, at, an un, at an unparalleled rate here, even in Wisconsin. Um, we're 47 um, uh, levees were broken on the Mississippi last spring, just in Iowa, just in Iowa, and with, with billions of dollars of damage. And in fact, if we look across the country at the record of billion dollar disasters over the last, um, say, 50 or 60 years, there is a strong increase. And it's not a linear increase, it's a, you say, an exponential increase, right? It's a curved, an upwardly rising increase. And so there are plenty of reasons that we all know that what we're seeing here is not simply, in quotes, a concern for our children and our grandchildren, and possibly in other parts of the world that don't look like here. It's happening here, it's happening now. Um, and that's a great concern to us. So, The, the impacts, of course, of climate change, and as a climate scientist, it's very easy to talk about um, goals. You know, well, we want to maintain uh, global temperature and degree to increases under 1.5 degrees Celsius, or at the worst, 2 degrees Celsius. And I think that really sells the whole thing short. I think really, once we start talking about temperature increases and we start talking about Celsius, um, then, then we really have missed the point, because the, the costs um, are, are, are not to the temperature record, the costs are to people, the costs are to ecosystems, the costs are to our communities. Um, and, and what we're seeing, of course, now, I think, and what I'm very excited to see, is, is the way that people are starting to mobilize around new ways of talking about the climate. Um, instead of talking about uh, temperature changes or even precipitation changes, they're still talking about ecosystems, polar bears, we're starting to talk about our communities. We're not only talking about our local communities, we're talking about those communities which are most disproportionately impacted by climate change. And, and, and who are they? Um, well, we're now starting to talk about the idea of climate justice. And I think this is a really key idea, recognizing that those who really have contributed at the very least to this problem we call climate change are being impacted the most. And whether that's, uh, whether that's communities of, of low economic means and often communities of color in Houston that were near the oil refineries because who else would live near, who had a choice would have lived near an oil refinery. Uh, when the flooding came through Houston, where did those floodwaters go? They, they impacted the people nearby. Right? We look at the lowlands of Louisiana and the flooded areas of Louisiana, and we look at the issue of climate refugees. And, and certainly it's easy to think when we say climate refugees to think of Syria and, and, and think of the, the, the climate, uh, in, uh, I'll say climate exacerbating effects uh, of Syria. Obviously it was coupled with colossally poor governance, seems like the understatement of the year. Uh, eternity, perhaps, uh, uh, and, 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 and just a lot of uh, economic, poor economic infrastructure, but certainly the, the droughts uh, in, in Syria substantially contributed to the mass migrations to the cities that were unprepared for it, and then the unrest that led to the Syrian revolution. So it's easy to think about climate refugees far away, but in the United States we have our first set of climate refugees. Um, they are tribal peoples in Louisiana, and they are tribal peoples in, in the Aleutian chain in Shishmaref, Alaska. And so we recognize, um, we recognize that those who have truly contributed the least to climate change, even in our own nation, are the ones who are already feeling the most impact. Um, and I'm completely off my, my uh, very carefully crafted out window. Uh, <laughs> So, so, what are some of those effects? And, 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 and other effects that we are feeling right now, and, and, and just out of curiosity, who in the room has suffered from or knows someone who has suffered from lung disease? So, so the spread of Lyme disease through 
through uh, the expanding uh, tick vector populations is clearly, uh, it, it's been clearly uh, drawn as a connection to climate change. Um, we also look at the increase in, in mosquito-borne illnesses and those populations um, uh, and transmitting diseases like dengue and, and, and malaria and, and other diseases of which, um, you know, those are tropical diseases, we think of them, but then we see them spreading northward into the southern United States, and, and we know that those will continue to spread over time. Uh, we look at the economic costs. I mentioned earlier um, the farmers who were unable to get their crops into the field, and, and, and the, the tragic rate uh, at which um, homestead family farms are, are being lost, uh, the, sorry, the accelerated rate at which homestead family farms are being lost in Wisconsin and throughout the Midwest. Um, these are the impacts. We also look at the impacts to uh, town cities and local governments as infrastructure fails. Uh, with, and we saw this all over Iowa so profoundly, and Nebraska so profoundly during the last spring. Um, and the enormous costs of mitigating bridge failures um, uh, as, as bridges are eroded through a process called scour, in which the footings of the bridges are, are ruined by the high water flow, and all, even overtopping where the, the road surfaces are ruined by these high flood flooding events, which are becoming more and more frequent. And so, on one hand, there's the sort of personal cost, but on the other hand, there are the community costs that are borne um, through our tax base and, and, and through our uh, uh, authority and local governments. Um, wow, that's a lot, right? And, and, and so where, do, where are we left with that? And, and I'll tell you that I, I've given a lot of climate talks over the year, usually, you know, lots of pretty graphs. Um, as a scientist, I love graphs. Probably much more than the people in my audience. Um, uh, so uh, that we, I've given a lot of talks over the years, and, and a lot of times we get to the point of saying, "Okay, so what do we do now?" And, and I, for many years, I, I, I ended the talks there because I was a scientist. I was simply reporting the science. I would say, "Here's what's changing. Here are the where we're, the losses are coming down, um, and um, do something." And then I would tell people to leave, and then that was it, right? I'll take your questions. And, and I think people left feeling hopeless, powerless, certainly disempowered, uh, and, and I did as well. Um, it, it, it took me quite a while, longer than you might think, um, uh, to realize that people needed real solutions at the end of, of whether it was in a, a public talk or whether it was in a class I was teaching. Um, and so I've really shifted my conversation about climate to be far less about the problems which we all now recognize and to be much more about the solutions. The other thing about talking about solutions is that, um, and I'll come back to this at the end, please tell me if I, if I forget, um, the minute we start talking about solutions, we can avoid the discomfort of, ta of, of disagreement. Because sadly, in this country, and we're one of the last countries in the entire world where there remains any substantial disagreement on the science of climate change, um, sadly, there remains a lot of disagreement in the public. Um, it's, it's disappearing rapidly, and the partisanship is starting to evaporate, and I'm very excited to see. And this is in no small part due to efforts like Wisconsin League of Conservation Voters and National League of Conservation Voters, and also Citizens Climate Lobby, um, that have have approached this issue and other, uh, and LCV with other environmental issues with such a ardently nonpartisan um, approach. Um, so I'm excited that that is going away, but the minute we start talking about solutions, we can get everyone involved. And what I'm excited about tonight is tonight we're here to talk about uh, solutions. Um, because the alternative is to get lost in the magnitude of the issue, the global scope of the issue, the inadequacy, the inherent inadequacy of our personal actions, and of course, the abject failure of our national politicians to act on the science that they've been aware of for decades. So then, what is our response? Well, we're seeing examples already. Um, right here in the Chippewa Valley, I'm, I'm very excited to say that uh, some of the examples we're seeing are just Monday night, the Eau Claire School Board uh, voted to set a target of carbon neutrality and 100% renewable energy by 2050. When they did so, they followed the example of the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. They followed the example of 
the city of Eau Claire. They followed the example of the Eau Claire County, and more recently, they followed the example of our governor and, and the state, uh, who have all committed to this 2050 carbon neutrality uh, goal. So I think, yeah, definitely a round of applause there. Not for me, but for us. As encouraging as this, as, as this is, it's, it's not enough. Um, it's vitally important that we begin to mitigate or reduce our emissions uh, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Um, however, we are already experiencing the impacts of climate change in our communities, uh, in, in the region, in our local ecosystems, uh, in the lands that we hold dear. Uh, and so, uh, it's also equally important to look on uh, to policies for adaptation, to, for building resilient uh, communities, resilient infrastructure. And a lot of times when we build resilient infrastructure, um, uh, A, we replace infrastructure which you know, maybe was in need of replacement anyway, but taking the extra effort and expense to build, to replace it with resilient infrastructure often means that we're building infrastructure that is um, more in line with a, a low emission future. Um, so it's really important to think in terms of our, our planning uh, as well as uh, uh, our investments as we move into the future. So it's a two-pronged response. This is very important. Um, we need to focus on infrastructure, resilient infrastructure, and, and we need to vote, uh, we need to uh, vote. Yes, we need to vote. Uh, thank you, League of Women Voters. Uh, thank you, League of Conservation Voters. Uh, we need to vote, but we also need to uh, craft policies at the local level uh, to reduce our emissions. Um, why? Well, what happens if we begin to reduce our emissions sooner is all of those reductions are much more effective than if we wait until later. Uh, does anyone here have a retirement account? Uh, or ever had any guidance on a retirement account, right? The goal was that all the advisors always said, begin saving early, it's far more effective uh, than trying to save a whole bunch at the end. Has anyone ever taken a class? It's far better to study early and consistently than to cram at the end. Uh, at least I tell my students that. Um, so, so it's incredibly important that the, the emission cuts that we make in the next 10 years um, really hold dividends and have an impact, a substantial impact on the climate of the last, say, 30 years of the century. Um, we need to begin actions now in order to see those effects um, by the end of the century. The longer we delay, um, the more we, we, we inevitably push off to uh, those who inherit the future from us, right? Our, our children and our grandchildren. But we also, um, uh, right, and, and, and as I said, also us. So why then is it so important to respond? Well, I, I've, I've illustrated to you that I think it's the right thing to do. Those of us who have uh, historically um, emitted more throughout our lifetimes, if we think about um, uh, my total carbon emissions throughout my lifetime, maybe you think of your total carbon emissions throughout your own lifetime, um, it's, it is in, incumbent upon us um, to act um, because we have benefited uh, so fundamentally and so profoundly um, from what some people call the carbon interval, right, from the fossil fuel interval. Um, so it's the right thing to do, but I, I think that that's not enough. Um, I, I wish it was, um, but at the end of the day, um, only I, I think a minority of people really respond because it's the right thing to do. Well, there's two, there's a couple of the reasons I want to, well, three of the reasons I want to illustrate for you. Um, the next reason is because it's inevitable that we will act. And maybe that's a surprising statement. I, I, I haven't articulated it this way for until very recently. Um, I say it's the right thing to do, but I've also now told you that it is inevitable that we will act. And, and why do I say this? And I, I say this from someone who looks at climate models on a regular basis. And if you look at even the most pessimistic of climate models, which show temperature increases by the end of the century of seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit, truly catastrophic um, of levels of warming, um, even they show that our emissions by the end of the century globally have 
trailed off to at least um, not increasing anymore. So there are, there are emissions have flatlined by the end of the century. That is to say, there are no climate models I know of anymore that assume true business as usual. Even the worst case scenarios you see out there in the climate modeling community assume that by 2050 to 2070, we've at least plateaued our emissions. What I've told you already, though, is the sooner we act, the more, um, the more effective the results are. So we can choose to wait and, 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 and cut our emissions later, but then it will cost far more money, it will be far less effective. Um, so the second reason, besides the right thing, it's because it's the right thing that I'll tell you, is it's because one way or the other we will act. I started my doctoral studies in chemistry studying ozone depletion. Not something we hear about very much anymore. Um, happy to say that's because the ozone hole, after um, very successful international legislation, is finally on the mend. It, it's taken a long time, um, but it, it, it's slowly starting to mend, and by 2070 or so, we'll be mostly back to, well, not quite back to normal, but pretty good. Um, I saw an interesting modeling study that someone did, oh, probably about 2005 or so. And they, they, they said, what if we had never stopped the emission of chlorofluorocarbons? Those are the freons or the CFCs, right? The stuff that was in our hairspray uh, and, and in, in our ham uh, for spraying on pants, right? Um, those things, what, what would happen if we never, if we'd simply increased uh, those in perpetuity? Um, and actually, fascinatingly, it would have resulted uh, by the end of the century in complete sterilization of the globe. There would have been so much UV light pouring in because of the absence of ozone that no life would have survived. Um, it's not a, that's actually worse than what, or worse models of climate change say. But of course, that was a, a laughable um, hypothetical because at some point, as people were dying by the millions, we probably would have stopped emitting them, right? Uh, I think a similar argument can be made here for CO2. Um, as, the, as the public perception of climate change grows more and more profound and more and more people are impacted personally or family members are impacted personally, we're affected by storm refugees or climate refugees coming into our own communities, um, we realize that, um, that it's necessary to act. And we're now seeing, you know, for the first time uh, if in the primary, we're seeing climate change as a primary issue, uh, primary election issue. Uh, and I fully anticipate it will be an issue again in the general election, something I've not seen in my entire professional career. So it is inevitable that we will act, and the sooner we act, the better off we will be. Here's the third reason. Because it just makes sense. Here's the thing. In the last five years, we hit something called grid parity. Has anyone heard that term before, grid parity? Anyone? What it means is that new, uh, the folks back at Excel Energy, our colleagues back at Excel Energy can tell you all about this. Uh, I encourage you to talk to them later. But uh, grid parity simply tells us that the cost for putting new solar or new wind on the grid is at or lower than the cost of putting on new natural gas or new coal. Now, it varies, yeah, that, that, thank you. That deserves a round of applause. That's very exciting, right? Now, of course, the cost of wind and solar vary across the country. Solar costs less. There's a shorter payback period for solar in New Mexico or Florida than there is in Wisconsin or, or God forbid, Seattle, Washington. Or, by the way, they're installing an awful lot of solar. Um, but, but that's very exciting. And now, we're getting to the point so rapidly that in some cases, installing solar in many places in the country, installing solar is cheaper than merely operating natural gas um, electric uh, facilities. Am I right there, guys? Wind is. Wind is, okay, sorry. Some reforms are renewable energy. Okay, good, well, I'll take that, thank you. Um, so, so why wouldn't we do it? What we're seeing is extraordinary stories of small communities in Texas um, that are, are as red as you can get, who are going to 100% renewable. Why? Because costs, the cost just makes sense. Um, so there's the costs of energy that are simply making it worth your economic while, or that is the payback is so good that you'd be, you may as well do it. 
and, and that's even without figuring in the amortized costs of, of the avoided costs. That is to say, we know that the floods in, in just in, in, in Iowa alone exceeded $1.6 billion. And that was within the first month or two after the floods occurred. Since then, I'm sure the costs have mounted up considerably. And that leaves out Nebraska. Uh, and, and some of the other states that were so badly impacted by the spring's flood. So we know the costs are enormous. So if we, and, and, and for, unfortunately, our economic models don't allow us to couple those very well, right? When we know that the costs of climate change are out there in the future, it's very hard to couple those into the costs uh, of, of, of the energy we pay right now. And it's actually not that hard. Um, there's no way to do it right now, but it turns out there's some really great policies out there um, called carbon pricing. And in carbon pricing, you simply uh, force the resource to pay for the damage it's causing. You price the resource to, to incorporate the damage. Let me give you a for instance. Um, a team of, of uh, public health scientists from Harvard did a study several years ago where they looked at the cost of, of, of the, the environmental costs and human health costs of coal. Uh, and what they did is they added up, and, and, and by the way, they, they neglected climate change in their, their analysis because they didn't really know how to deal with it. And so they just looked at the environmental costs and the human health costs of mining coal, transporting coal, processing coal, all before it got to the, 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 um, the power plant. And so what do we pay for energy? Something like 11, 12 cents a kilowatt hour, right? Well, at the end of their analysis, they found that the cost, environmental costs of coal were 19 cents per kilowatt hour. The costs to human health and the environment were more than the sticker price of the coal, of the electricity that was generated by burning that coal. Who pays that then? We all do, right? We pay that through higher taxes, we pay that through uh, hospital admission fees, we pay that through long-term environmental degradation. Um, and so the truth is that right now, the way our economy is set up, it doesn't take into account the true costs, the true human and the true environmental, and really, if we're honest, the true economic costs of burning fossil fuels. All we really need to do is add a charge to fossil fuels that is proportional to the true cost of society, and then, amazingly, fossil fuels go out of a way at an alarming rate. Uh, so talk to the folks back at the table there, the Citizens Climate Lobby table there. They'll be happy to talk to you about carbon fee and dividend, which is an innovative plan in which uh, we can price carbon, eliminate our emissions faster than any other uh, past legislation in this country, uh, and the, 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 the 60, lowest 60% or 65% of the American people are held harmless in terms of increased costs. So make sure you talk to Kate and Patty back there about that. Um, so if you add in the avoided costs, uh, along with just simply the fact that uh, renewable energy has gotten so cheap, it's really hard to see why we wouldn't move there as quickly as possible. And then, of course, the last issue is just simply this. We have to act because the, the, the sheer prospect of what the end of the century looks like without our action in the next 10 years is too awful to consider. As I said at the beginning of this, what's wonderful about talking about solutions to climate change, which you'll hear from our next speakers here and, and how they're applied right here in, in the town of Menominee, um, what's great about this is we can talk about solutions and guess what? You don't even have to care about climate change in order to make those decisions. The, the, the case for acting on, on reducing our carbon emissions already is so strong that you don't even have to open that can of worms. You can just look at the cost-benefit analysis right now, um, and, 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 and as so many communities across this country are starting to do, um, you can act right away. So I think I'll leave my, uh, the rest of my comments at that. Uh, I invite any questions you have. Uh, I encourage you to, to talk with my colleagues at League of Conservation Voters, uh, at Citizens Climate Lobby, at Excel Energy, at League of Women Voters, and of course, Zymer G Brewery, one of my favorite local breweries, by the way. Uh, even in Eau Claire, I, I, uh, I have your beer at uh, Silly Serrano. Great stuff. 
Um, so thank you for our hosts as well. And I'll take any questions. Yes? You mentioned carbon fee dividend. Yes. How, what, can you get into the basis of that? Who charges it? Where does it go? How is it dispersed? Is it a governmental thing, a local thing, community thing? What? Mayor, thank you so much for asking. Uh, no one, no one really, usually people aren't say, tell me more, so I'm really excited to hear you say that. Um, it's a national policy. I mean, it's best as a national policy. Um, and so the work of Citizens Climate Lobby is with federal legislators um, on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but simply put, and, and I'll make it as brief as I can, um, you apply the cost only where the fossil fuel enters the economy. So at the port, at the wellhead, at the mine. That means in terms of implementation, there's relatively few places you need to apply it. Um, it generates an extraordinary amount of revenue. It starts out at $15 per ton of CO2 emitted in year one. In year two, it's $25. In year three, it's $35. In year four, it's $45. You see where this is going. You can do the math. It accelerates very rapidly, although it starts small. In the first year, it's maybe a dime on a, on a gallon of gas. It's not too much. But the problem with the carbon taxation scheme, because that's what it kind of is, uh, is that everyone gets impacted. Everyone gets impacted right away. Our cost of gasoline goes up, the cost of, yeah, cost of home heating goes up, the cost of food goes up, the cost of goods and services goes up. Uh, and it would really badly impact a lot of people. And so what you do is you take all of that revenue, 100% of it, minus about a percent or two for administrative costs, and you dividend it back out to the American people on a per household basis every month. Uh, and that's the way about 60 to 65 percent, uh, everyone but the top 35 percent of the population in terms of income, are either held harmless, that is, the, 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 that's no net losses, or they actually see a, a, a net gain in, in monthly income. Um, but how is that bringing down the carbon footprint? Great question. So now, the cost of, of fossil fuels goes up rapidly. And so if that were true, our, my colleagues over there at Excel Energy would move, well, they're already planning to move away from fossil fuels very quickly. Um, but imagine how much faster they would move if they knew that the price of, of, of coal, of natural gas, was increasing at that rapid rate on an annual basis. So the, the big companies, the energy companies and, and big industries will factor that into their planning and move rapidly away from it. It's, what it simply does is, here's the playing field right now, right? Fossil fuels, um, there's already infrastructure built for fossil fuels um, in the form of refineries and pipelines and, 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 and trucks and everything like that. Uh, so fossil fuels have a strong advantage even though we passed parity um, and, 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 and now renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. The, the problem is a lot of the infrastructure doesn't exist for renewables yet. And so what it does is it tilts that playing field. It tilts the cost curve rapidly, very rapidly, until very quickly um, renewals become so much cheaper than fossil fuels, everyone moves up. Now, if you're not a company, if you're not an electricity provider, you're a household, um, and you know that your gas, your uh, gasoline tax, your gasoline price will increase by 10, 20 cents a gallon in the first year, but then another 10 or 20 cents a gallon in the next year, and the next year, and the next year. But now, you're also getting a dividend check for you know, over a thousand dollars a year, what are you going to do with that money? If you're able to, you're going to invest in winterizing your home, you're going to invest in uh, an electric vehicle, you're going to invest in, and you will find these paybacks occur very quickly. One of the nice side-on effects of this policy is that very quickly the, the, the people who are proactive and made these investments early on get rewarded very quickly because what used to be a 19-year payback for a solar array suddenly became a five-year payback on a solar array. And so that's that's the, the, the way this, this works. Um, for the people who are still further down on the economic scale, um, um, that's a little trickier, but in the end, they're still seeing a, a, a dividend check of maybe a couple thousand dollars a year uh, per family and in the first year. And, and, and of course, that of course rapidly increases over time. That allows them to uh, take the additional burden of the economic burden of, of the carbon fee. Does that answer your question? Well, it does. Just that you have to trust your legislators and that that money goes to where originally was meant to go rather than get absorbed into the general fund. That there it goes. And meanwhile, everybody's paying more money and you're not going to pay for the power. Absolutely. So I would encourage you all to look at House Resolution 763. This very idea is, has, was proposed in Congress last December in the 115th session 
has been proposed again in January of the 116th session currently. Uh, it is awaiting uh, hearings in House Ways and Means, um, Energy Environment, and I think... Um, it's Foreign Affairs. Foreign Affairs Committee, yes, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, and so uh, uh, in, in that bill, it's, it's laid out in stone, 100% um, dividend back to households. Uh, sorry, not 100%. It's, there's a small increment for um, uh, for uh, um, administrative costs. Additionally, there's a couple of exemptions. Agriculture is exempted, um, importantly, and that's a much longer conversation, but there's very good reasons in the short term to exempt, exempt agriculture, uh, Department of Defense, and a couple other organizations. So, yes, I agree, that's a challenge, uh, but the bill is there, and it's, and it's, it's being taken seriously. Also has bipartisan backing, I might say. It has a Republican co-sponsor, a Democratic co-sponsor, and now a total of 68 co-sponsors in the U.S. House of Representatives. How can we like, make sure that, A, that carbon tax like, doesn't unfairly uh, target individuals instead of massive democracy from a lot of your policies? And how, how, how can we as a community together to kind of like, fight that? That's a, that's a really good question. So, I, there's so many different answers to that question. Um, so first of all, let me say, um, there's some really great reporting that just came out that said something like 70%, and I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, so I apologize, but I encourage you to go out and find the article. Something like 70% of historic emissions have been uh, from about 30 companies, or maybe it's 30% of global emissions from 70% of 70 companies. There's a 30, there's, there's a 70 or something there, but it is a fairly small amount of number of corporations that have a result of, that have emitted the vast majority. And, and, and let's be honest, they're mostly uh, fossil fuel companies, right? Um, having said that, there is an uncomfortable truth, which is that we need those companies to change their business practices. We need them to do it faster. Um, uh, and, and what's more, they, the biggest ones have the capital to do it, to move really quickly. Now, some are beginning to, and we're actually seeing uh, some corporate leadership eclipse uh, certainly federal governmental action, right? So that's exciting. Um, but although it's distressing that these companies have been the source of so much emissions historically, we, I fear, need to work with them to eliminate the emissions. We need them not to oppose carbon fee and dividends because if they do, well, we know what happens. Um, we see when, when Exxon stood against uh, uh, cap and trade in 2009, we saw what happened, right? Um, so it, it's, it's, it's an interesting balance. On one hand, am I angry at, at, um, uh, at the corporations which have polluted so much? Certainly. Have I, when I'm being honest, have I benefited from it also? Yeah, I mean, sure, I own a Prius, but it burns gasoline too, right? And so I need to take into account my own culpability in, in this equation here. Um, and I, I, I feel this is why I'm, I work, work with CCL, is I believe we need to work with everybody. We need to work on both sides of the aisle. We need to work with corporations. We need to work with uh, individuals. Um, because honestly, we can't wait for a governmental system or a corporate system or an economic system that we want in order to act on climate, we have to act on climate now and hope that those, um, that more favorable systems arise from that. So. Yeah, the question was how do we as, as consumers make good decisions about what we purchase? Sometimes it's not intuitive. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for you. I'll give you a quick answer. In one of my classes right now, I'm teaching a, a process called life cycle assessment, in which we take um, from the, the raw materials all the way through end of life, uh, which would be the, the landfill or the recycling center, we look at products. Um, oh, uh, and, 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 and we look at uh, their full environmental impacts, be it clean water, clean air, carbon, uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, energy consumption, all of land use and all the rest. Um, that's not possible for most of us, right? Um, so there are some labeling systems that are going out there. So look at bcorp.com, 
um, look at uh, Cradle to Cradle um, a website, and so we're starting to see more and more certifications come out. Um, and if we vote with our dollars, as an economist would say, if we vote with our dollars for pro products that are, are more sustainable, um, then, then we will see the corporations respond. I'm already seeing, I've been teaching this class for three years now, and it's amazing to me how much more available is on the web um, for corporations um, that, that are uh, advertising their greenness, their sustainability. Now the question is, is it greenwashing, or is it not? That's really hard to answer. But they're hearing the message from consumers that that's what consumers are interested in. I think that's very interesting. Uh, look at the great work that Excel is doing in, in, in going towards carbon neutrality. Certainly, they're doing it out of economic self-interest to the corporation, they should. Um, but they're also doing it because it's the right thing to do and they're gonna get us to carbon neutrality in this state, in this part of the state, faster than just about anywhere else in the country. Uh, so, um, because they heard that people were, uh, please, Correct me later if I'm wrong, but they heard their consumers saying, look, we're really interested in solar, we really want solar, and they provided solar gardens in Eau Claire. Um, uh, so I, I think we have to work with our corporations and they have to hear our voices, to your question earlier, um, but I think we have to work with them once we get to the table.